So a little bit of background about us. We're a pesticide free vegetable production farm. We also have pasture pigs and pasture plant hens. We're only on three acres. So I know that's a big difference from a lot of the divisions in the room today. Um, we are on the outskirts of Fort Collins, barely in Maryland County. And we have geared ourselves to serve the farmers markets, the restaurants, the CSA customers, the roadside stand folks, and basically focus on direct retailing as a way to capture the biggest dollar return that we can on every unit that we sell. So that's our focus. Uh, we run a 65 member CSA program, and then we do the old time market in Fort Collins, Colorado. And we are a for profit farm operation. There's a lot of nonprofits floating around these days, so we are for profit. We are leasing privately owned lands in Maryland County. So, brief history here. Um, it's kind of backwards. Uh, Raising Roots started in 2015, and I've moved every year since then. We'll talk about that in a little bit and what it taught us. Prior to that, I worked in, at various places and apprenticed, um, bumping around Colorado. And then prior to that, I started the campus farm on uh, Towson University, North Baltimore. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Um, and that was before I made my way out here. And I apprenticed, managed a small farm. Worked at Denver Urban Gardens, learned about why I don't want to be a nonprofit, and then started my own thing in 2015. Uh, Doug was great. Nothing against nonprofits, just not the way, not the way I want to go out the direction I want to go with farming. So we moved the entire operation every year. Uh, this taught us a whole lot, as you can imagine. Um, kind of precluded having livestock. We couldn't have livestock in those years, it just didn't make sense. So it was strictly a vegetable operation, running annuals. Um, Maybe we built a propagation house, walk in cooler, and I lived in an RV that I moved around to our lease plots. So it was pretty shoestring. Uh, I was, what, 23, 24 at the time, so I kind of get away with it and family to support. So I was just out there investing everything every year into the operation. And then finally, in uh, late 2016, I linked up with the current landowner and I built the operation to this current spot, and we really let it go around. It's a beautiful location just on the outskirts of northwest of Fort Collins. Um, so this taught us to be incredibly lean. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who Ben Hartman is, uh, the lean farm author. Uh, he's adapted Toyota's production methods of lean production um, into farming. Uh, so really great author, working on Ben Hartman. So we were kind of heading down this track before we even knew, knew who he was. And we got to meet him two weeks ago in Montreal, he's a really nice guy. Highly recommend looking him up, no matter what kind of production system you're on, um, off of Ben Hartman. Um, so, Dennis Manoride is our current property owner, and they are stewarding the land and have trusted me to take on that mission since they're not farmers themselves. Uh, so, that's the partnership that we currently have with them. This was in 2015 and birthed it. Um, just from this birthday, you can probably assume there's a lot of logistical issues with this, with this property. Um, one of which was water access, one of which was soil, uh, one of which was deer fencing. Uh, those are all negatives on this property. So it's just a snapshot of my prior history of Fort Hitt, where we, where we are now. Beautiful location, but coyotes, deer, I mean, impossible to have veggies without long-term infrastructure inputs. And I didn't know this there. So now, uh, we have a ton of neighbors. Uh, big change from what you just saw. Let me give you this quick over, over my shot. I'm going to hit the, the clip. So this is where we are now. We'll see roads, neighbors, how dense it is. And this was just taken by my buddy who was cutting down a cottonwood tree. I'll let that one more time go off. Just so you get the picture, look at all those houses. We are right in town. That's the farmhouse. All right. So with that in mind, we, we use extremely dense plantings. The living space is right there. You're on top of everything. Our rotations are very dense. Um, we have stacked uses and functions in a lot of locations on the property. So with that in mind, season extension is key. Uh, we have to get the most that we can out of all square footage on the property. So if we can put a low tunnel up or a high tunnel up and get another few weeks in the shoulder season, that wildly expands our ability to access markets and grow crops and shorten up that uh, seed to harvest window. So that's our current focus. 
um, that we can get so much more square footage and protection growing. And that really jumpstarts us to the next level as far as what we can sell and harvesting. I'll show you a quick picture here. Looks like I'm going to have to go back and forth. Maybe I'll stay over here. So there's a, a kit you can get from Farmer's Rent. We really like these. Um, you, can buy your, you can buy your own top rail and bend it um, for putting up three or four of them. It made sense for us to buy their kit. Let me show you their photos because they're way nicer than the photos I can take. Um, basically, you can do whatever you want with them. You can put them wherever. They're 100 feet long. They're basic metal framing. You guys may have seen these before. Um, basic season extension. The cool thing about these is they're not heated at all. Um, so this has benefited us greatly from protecting our tomatoes from hail damage. I'm sure everybody here has seen hail from last year. Um, we have we had four hailstorms last year alone. So it protected our nice uh, market tomatoes from those hailstorms. Yes, it shot up the plastic cover on them, but the plastic cover at 300 bucks probably saved us 3,000 in tomatoes in that one week. Um, so I really, really like getting into protected growing, not just for season extension, but also because of the change of climate. Um, our final harvest on that note was in early December, later than we've ever gone for with vegetables. So this is, the, this is one of our cat tunnels. You might recognize this young lady. She's here today. Uh, sorry to blow your cover, you know. Uh, so this was in late December. We've never, or mid-December, we've never gone that late with ours before. So that was huge for us. We can trial what varieties to invest in this cold weather. This is that same low tunnel just weeks prior. And you can see the density of our plantings there. So the tools, methods, and practices that we use, um, again, we're just on two acres of veggie production, total property is three acres. So we've gotten to like this, uh, this BCS 853 model. It's a walk behind tractor. Uh, there's a bunch of attachments that you can get for them, but they get pretty pricey. Uh, they'll sell you a snowblower, a chipper shredder, a flail mower, a, uh, a log splitter, uh, but they're, they're expensive. So we've really dialed in just a couple attachments. We use the 30 inch walk behind tiller, uh, tiller depth system, which is basically a roll bar that we put in line behind the tiller for bed craft. And then we use the uh, rotary plow. So that's the three attachments that we have. They will sell you tons of attachments if you want them. Um, on that note, there's a rabbit hole of technology for the small to mid sized producer. If you're on small acreage or large acreage, everybody has it, I'm sure. Uh, there is a massive rabbit hole. So we're trying not to go too far down that rabbit hole. Um, every year, we kind of make two or maybe three capital investments on tools and materials. So the BCS was one of them. Um, I'll show you the uh, attachments they'll sell you real quick. And there's tons. It's kind of amazing. This is an Italian company. They have their American office out of uh, Portland and dealers all over the country. But if you just take a quick look at this, I mean, you know, you can spend. Sixty thousand dollars right here on stage one. It's crazy. Uh, so we said we spent about five or six thousand investing in hours, and that allows us to standardize our bed frame. Um, so the operation has four full-time crew members and then a part-time, uh, two folks part-time, and then we do work trade shares, where instead of folks paying for their CSA, which is the box of veggies each week, they come out and spend four to six hours on the farm helping us out with production, weeding, harvest, transplanting. CA propagation, whatever we need. And that's a really nice boost. We have about five dedicated CSA members. This, this is the crew from last year. Pretty hodgepodge crew. <laughs> All right, that's the BCS right there. Um, cat for scale. And you have the 30 inch tiller that's currently on it. Tucked behind that is the rotary plow. And so that has the PTO drive on the back. That's what makes this so different from walk line tillers usually that they're in line, chain driven um, to the times. This has a PTO drive, so much greater power transfer. And I think it's got a 13 horsepower on the road on it. So this thing has a lot of bang for the buck. So when we flip beds, this is um, essential to us to really utilize our space. And I wrote up this example here. In one bed, we might get four crops out. So for example, the spring arugula direct seeded to a transplant of early summer head lettuce into midsummer beets using the uh, paper pot transplanter into a fall kohlrabi. That's just one example how we utilize these beds. Because um, in past years, maybe we go into the fall and have 
a dozen beds that we weren't harvesting for our last four October markets. That's just wasted space. So I think we can really bump our efficiency quite a bit without expanding past that two acres production. And I know uh, there's a lot of land out here that's really tempting to turn up all under bought. So for us, we're really trying to maximize those small acres that we are on without taking on greater risk and cultivating on larger space. Some of the uh, technology that we have invested in at the bottom there, the Jane JP1 seeder, uh, simulated nice precision seeder, Japanese paper pot transplanter, the BCS, uh, drill powder green tar from the farmer's friend, uh, cool lot and walk-in cooler, low-tech germination chambers that we built, uh, irrigation timers, and then just overhead watering sprinklers in some situations versus drip tape can save us a lot of time. So our major bottlenecks have been bed prep, transplanting, harvest, and then drip tape. Uh, so we had to standardize our bed prep. Uh, it just was slowing us down so much. So this is what we came up with. We will do a mulching mow, um, and we just use a walk behind mulching on Say like bush beans, but not. We'll just mow them down, leave that green matter in the field. Uh, BCS will sell you a $2,000 glam mower, um, but I got a $50 mulching push mower. Uh, we'll broad fork the bed. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Add any com any uh, compost or soil or mineral amendments that we need into a very light skin tilt. So with soil practices, we don't do a deep inversion. Um, we will we will do a skin tilt to take off uh, that root matter and just reincorporate and homogenize it to leave a nice seed bed. But we won't invert. We won't go six, eight, twelve inches deep on that tiller. And then we use this tiller depth system or bar to actually raise the tiller up even higher. And it rolls out a nice seed bed in line behind the tiller. I'll show you the picture of that. This is from Earth Tools um, out of Kentucky. They're direct competitors of the BCS. So this is the roll bar right here. And you can see how it leaves that nice seed bed and pushes the tiller body up so that you're not inverting down to a greater depth than you need to. All right. Question? Yeah. What, what is your seed placement compared to that, uh, that cut of the soil? Depending on what we are seeding, like a brassica seed is very small, you know, like cabbage or, um, or mustard or mizuna, and we're only putting those about a quarter inch deep. And then if it's a larger seed, like winter squash or peas, those are going uh, that half inch to three quarter inch deep. Um, a lot of this stuff we end up transplanting to save us time. That if we can get a bed prepped and have it ready, we don't want to waste time on poor germination and competing with weeds at the same time that's going in the ground. We can get it a three week transplant start. Uh, we don't have to deal with any of that stuff. Uh, so when we direct seed, that leaves a nice long seed bed for us. And then the seeders, we adjust the depth depending which seed's going to go. And the Jang's pretty good at that, the Jang JP1. This is a broad board. Uh, here's another photo of them. Uh, you jump on these, and they're really great for aerating clay. Super labor intensive. If I was on more than two acres, I wouldn't want one. It's crazy. Get a spade or a cash on your PTO. Do the same thing. Um, but for us in our tight spaces, these go down an area at a nice depth, lift up that clay, bust up that clay so the roots can penetrate. Um, but again, a spader attachment on PTO would do the same thing, just a lot more expensive. And for a lot of our field access, we couldn't get a big tractor in um, with our field margins because we're utilizing all the space. That's kind of the nature of the property we're on. And then if we need to do a final bed prep step, we can raise the bed even further by running the rotary plow on the walkways. It shoots the soil up from the walkways onto the tops of the bed, giving us an even deeper, loamy soil for those seeds in. If we need it, it's particularly for um, uh, deeper root crops like carrots or parsnips or uh, dicarm. So if we are putting the crop in the ground, it's over 60 days to maturity. We'll use inorganic black plastic mulch, and we'll go underneath with the drip lines. Um, I don't want to spend all my time weeding. On this scale, you drive yourself nuts if you weren't using black plastic mulch. I know it's plastic. I know it's not a good organic input. We pull it out of there. The plastic does not get turned back in. But um, we've tried it with straw. We've tried it with leaves. You still end up having to get in there and do a deep weeding four or five times a season. So we use this black plastic mulch. Um, we'll transplant through that um, with two-inch soil blocks. I like the soil boxes, they'll, uh, they'll air root instead of being bound up in a plastic prop tray. Uh, if it's under 60 days, we're still trying to transplant, like I mentioned, to save that time. And that's the Japanese paper pot transplanter, to show you a picture of that. That allows us to implant very young seeds. It's not really transplanting. You're controlling germination. There may be 
yay high, okay? And then you just zip them out in the bed. So you're giving them a little help in there. It's not traditional transplanting. It's more of a implantation of a controlled jerk of And this, uh, this really helps because I don't know if you guys have tried to uh, direct seed, say, carrots in mid-May for a fall, a fall harvest. Maybe 70% with some of those heat patches that we get where the irrigation just can't keep up for germination rates. So we can control that germination prior to it getting into the field. And that's, that's huge for us. Let's see. That's our propagation house. We're reskinning it right now. It's one of my current projects. We'll do the two layers of uh, plastic insulation blower fan to go in between. Um, Nold supplies will sell you all these all this stuff you can call a basket eye. And we'll get that going. This is our uh, main termination propagation area. It's only a 20 by 40 pad. This is the germination chamber that I mentioned. This is a DIY uh, design from Ben Hartman. And basically, there's a water pan in the bottom. You got that hot water heater on it. I don't know if you can see that in the pan. You fill that up with water. There's a uh, digital thermometer, that box outside on the top right. That takes your sensor inside. We can set that. So carrots like to germinate at 68 degrees or so. Set that to 68. Um, when that temperature in there drops below 68, it'll kick on the hot water uh, heater and send up waves of steam inside that unit. Keep it super moist. These ceilings don't need light until day three or four in some cases. And that way we can get close to 100% germination on all of our really dense plantings before they go out into the field. So we have a couple of these and we'll set them at different temperatures and then more crops go in there. That's another uh, very early season um, propagation room. If it's just too cold to get out into that propagation house, we just built this in our summer. That's another uh, germination chamber right in there. That is the transplant, um, the Japanese paper bot transplanter. So these chains zip out. You basically pull a corner of this uh, seedling tray, pull it through the channel, and stake it. And this is ground driven. You put it that way, and it zips out all these starts, like so, that you can see. And they come with uh, two inch, four inch, or six inch paper tabs that unravel between each cell. There's 264 cells in that tray. And then this thing cuts a, uh, a ridge, or a furrow rather, underneath that has a little furrow shape. And then it drops it in the furrow channel. And then you adjust, back here it has uh, paddles that you adjust between the wheels, and it closes the so it's a very non-mechanized way of spitting out a ton of transplants. It's ground here. There's no motor on this thing. Um, tight spaces. I mean, you can get, look how tight they are. All that stuff's going to grow up to shade out weeds. And like I mentioned, you're three weeks ahead. Compare that to dropping the seeds in the soil. You'd have a weeding nightmare. We can completely avoid pre-emergent herbicides and all that stuff. Um, there's no need because we're just so far ahead of the weed pressure with this, with this method. How do you pull it? Um, the tool itself has handles. They're actually out of the frame up there on the high leg. It has two handles. And you just pull it walking backwards. Well, human. Yeah, ground driven human pull. Human. Yep, yep. It probably train an ox real well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and this, this brings us to how we harvest. Uh, since we have so many different types of crops, it's really important for us to be efficient at harvest. I mean, we would drive ourselves nuts. Because we have different methods for all of our different greens. So a nice tool that we use for all of our cut and come again greens is this greens harvester, again from that company Farmers Friend. Uh, and this is no joke. It can make baby greens profitable. Because <laughs> you could be cutting out there with a knife. That's what we used to do. Instead, this has a very sharp blade that, when attached to a drill, oscillates back and forth. And it zips off the top layer of your greens. And so you can control your height, and you walk down the bed with it. And it will speed up our harvest. So you used to take six people with knives about uh, 40 minutes on 100 foot bed of arugula. Two people using this tool, one with the tool and one with the harvest bin, about 20 minutes. So an immense um, change in uh, efficiency there. And then we'll use uh, small serrated knives, pruners, shoulder baskets that'll hang on straps so your, uh, your hands are right here, you're not going to the ground to okay. So small changes like that, so we can keep moving quick, not be tight bins and bedding down uh, in a low tunnel with tomatoes particularly. You don't want that to be bedding to the ground each time you used to do that for the last season in the cells. Uh, so these hand baskets stand up off the ground are really nice. 
Um, so you picture those. Pretty basic design here. It's just stuff to help us all get off of the, the ground, essentially, not be pulling, pulling hard as it is behind us. Um, and then we do a hydrocool process, which is basically a water cool down, um, which brings the heat uh, temperature off the produce and then also rinses. Uh, so that's a, that would be a first rinse for us. And then if it's a roots, if it's a roots crop, we'll do a wash spray down. If it's a greens crop, it goes into our bubbler, which is basically just a uh, tub of water with a PVC manifold that we built in the bottom of it, drill holes in it, and there's a spa pump blowing hot air, or uh, not hot air, just air, that you would see in like a hot tub, like jet bubbles. And it blows that air through the PVC manifold, bubbles the water, knocks the dirt off the greens, cools them down. Come out of there, um, put them into a uh, spin dryer. You guys probably seen this modified washing machine that just run on the spin cycle. Put them in that. Um, sanitize the grain, of course, goes into mesh bags. Comes out of there mostly dry. If it needs another drying round, they'll go on mesh tables, overhead work bins, straight down into a finish bin, into our rocking cooler. So we can get out, um, shoot, probably close to a 50 pounds of greens an hour running that system. Um, that's the extent of our mechanization of harvest. Uh, we often harvest two to three times per week, and we'll try to schedule that to make sense with our restaurant deliveries with three crops a little earlier with their shelf life, greens on Friday. We got CSA pickup Friday, Saturday. We got market on Saturday, so our week kind of centers around harvesting at the end of the week and trying to get everything done that we need to get done production-wise prior to that harvest time. This is the uh, greens harvester in action. Cutting down uh, arugula, by the looks of it, probably a week left. That's early June. That's really late for the legal crop. We can get away with that using um, shade cloth and bug netting over it to diffuse the heat. Um, but I guarantee you it's getting spicy. This was our walking cooler. Um, we're currently building a new one. I'll show you that in a sec. This is pretty DIY, guys. I mean, salvage materials, OSB on the outside. Um, walk in, and you've got a window AC unit running on cool up technology. That basically tricks window AC if you're running way lower than 60 degrees they're supposed to run. It'll make it believe it's much hotter out by pumping heat into its uh, room sensor. And then you can get down to 35 degrees inside this cooler, which for us, for our shelf life, gives us a huge advantage in market. So we can come out Saturday morning, roll out some market, and have stuff come out of those bins looking really crisp and well hydrated. This is our new walk in cooler that we're building right now. Uh, it's about three times as big, cement floor. Probably put two AC units and two cool lots in there. That will be our new wash pack. Uh, we used to do all of our wash pack post harvest stuff in a low tunnel. Same design that I showed you the pictures of for that caterpillar tunnel. When it was hot out, it was really hot. When it was cold out, it was really cold. Uh, so this would be nice to be in a more climate controlled environment. This is in a warehouse on the property that we had to restore prior to being able to build in there. So on to our practices, uh, we are pesticide free. Uh, we're able to achieve that using a nice crop rotation and really proactive soil fertility. Uh, we have found that if you have good soil, your pest uh, pressure is so reduced. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. And we've built in losing perhaps 50% of any good event due to pest pressure because our customers will pay a higher premium on something that is pesticide free. We're okay with that. Um, on this property, First couple of years, we were all about adding H manure, fall leaves, straw, finished compost, probably for a total of around six to eight inches in some places. Um, as a result, our biology is through the roof um, with active bacteria, uh, organic matter, we average 6% across the five plots on the farm, uh, which is obscenely high for our area. Some plots test as high as 10%. Um, but the danger there is that your NPK is way high. Uh, so we have, uh, through a lot of talks with Natalie actually, uh, discovered that we need to change to a more soil mineral mineralization and trace mineral approach at this point because we have stockpiled so much biology in those fields. To add more manure and finished compost, probably going to get our phosphorus up way too high. Probably can get our pH way too high. We're already on high NL pH. We're already on high NL nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so that's really been informative. Uh, to get into trace mineralization or calcium magnesium ratio and the soil bacteria content. Um, sources for this that we're looking into are, of course, Albrecht and Yale Kinsey currently, um, and then the folks at CSU, Natalie, Mark Chansky, and a couple of the other farmers in our areas. We hold uh, farmer roundtables where we discuss this stuff. That's where we're at for soil health right now. 
Um, cover crops have been a big challenge for us. The reason for that is our final markets are in late October, and your window in our region for a cover crop, as I understand it, is uh, second week of September or so, you know, in that, in that range. We still have five market weekends left, so it's be pulling uh, units out of production in order to put in a cover crop, which doesn't make sense to me. Uh, so instead, we will we'll do a mulching with leaves or straw, which I hate. It's a lot of work. They blow away in the wind. Um, something else on a lean perspective that we're doing is just leaving our inorganic black plastic mulching out on the field and letting the transplants in on winter kill. That way we're keeping roots in the soil. No, it's not pretty. doesn't look like a bunch of uh, dry grass. It's all nice and high. But this keeps our soil in place. It keeps some, the winter sun off. It keeps the winds off. If you have the walkways were exposed, that's all right. Um, so this is our recent method for if we cannot get a cover crop in, just leave the inorganic black mulch. Yeah, the wind tears up a little bit, so what? And then we're still growing in that low zone on the left side of that field. Have you seen where getting that black plastic on there it helps keep your soil up faster than some of these recommended products? Absolutely. The question was, do we get uh, soil heating up under these covers? The answer is yes. Yeah, so that's a big benefit, especially in the spring for our transplants. On some of these beds, I might go in and look at them, and we might be able to reuse, especially one of those. So we should be able to use that. We pull out that stuff and pop it in a transplant. That's so much less labor intensive than pulling it, bed prepping, um, running out of drip tape again, putting down a new one, burning it, cutting it, and I mean, we might just leave it. So we're all about cutting those corners where it makes sense. But yeah, in addition to that, it heats up the soil so we can get in our early starts even earlier. And our first round of annual weeds might germinate and then die. So we don't have to be in the first place. Yeah, so organic certifiers may not like this. We have chosen not to get certified. Uh, most of our sales are, 99% of our sales are face-to-face -face with customers at market, chefs, CSA customers at our roadside stand. Um, so yeah, we, we have this week a couple things. We were discussing last night. The um, adhesive and the paper pot transplanter that holds the cells together it is compliant in about 20 states. Uh, it's TBD in Colorado. Um, so yeah, there's some things that we're definitely sweeping around here that we might have to take a closer look at if we were to get certified. But with our markets, it's it's not, it, it wouldn't pay off for us. We're already getting a premium because of our face to face interactions. Yeah. So we will fertigate through our drip tape three to four times per season. Uh, last year we did a fish hydrolysate with kelp. Um, I am not a soil scientist, um, but apparently the fish hydrolysis is a lot better than fish and meal in terms of what it will leave in your soil. Um, I think there's a lot of active enzymes that help root growth that will stick around versus the fish emulsion will not do that. That will just be a one and done kind of thing with fish emulsion. And then that calcium and magnesium ratio that I mentioned uh, will dilute with some molasses. And then um, the Mammoth Pea Company in Fort Collins, they get us uh, samples. It's pretty pricey stuff. I don't know if you'd buy it otherwise, but we have samples of that stuff in the right there. And um, I haven't done it side by side uh, to isolate how good the Mammoth Pea is, so I can't really answer that. But in the cocktail, uh, we have really good results. For example, when that hail hit in last week in May, I believe, our collard greens and kale were shredded. I mean, they were pre-harvested for us. We did a kale. Uh, a hail hail CSA box that we I mean, it was it was a nightmare. And we probably it the weeks following, actually days following, and those plants ended up looking better, taller, darker green, more productive than they did prior to the hail. So this this fertigation mix really proved to us that we have not maxed out our soil fertility. So we're seeing a really nice response so we're trying to do it. I don't want to overdo it, we do it about three to four times per season. And if we're coming up on fruiting with tomatoes, then you back off the nitrogen and go with some uh, phosphorus instead, or uh, potassium instead as well. But definitely back off the nitrogen as we get closer to, to fruiting on fruit crops. Um, so I mentioned down here how our phosphorus is getting real high. Part of that is the local regional inputs um, that if we're putting on finished compost and fall leaves and manure, that's all coming from this area. So our area is already pretty high in pH. All these all these things are eating the same inputs that we're growing. So I don't love the idea of trucking in minerals from around the country or around the world, but that's kind of where we're at, it seems, that we cannot keep relying on the local inputs who's going to keep sending our soil fertility burger in one direction that we're already overloaded on. And then uh, we're taking part in a really cool project based out of Boulder right now. It's a citizen soil health project. It's an NRCS program. 
plain angle, this with black, is putting it together. And you get one free uh, Haney test and one free PLF base oil test per year. Those are more soil bio biological and health tests, more so than they are your basic uh, um, trace mineral MPK tests. And that's from uh, Ward Labs, W-A-R-B. Um, definitely recommend looking, looking them up. It's pretty reasonable um, price-wise. And you get cation exchange, you get organic matter reading, you get all the stuff that you would get in a basic soil test. Uh, and you can just do that um, with these guys. I, I like that lab a lot, Ward and then also Logan Lab. All right, moving on, pasture pigs. We only run six to eight per year. We're able to command a high dollar on these because we control the butchering, the raising, the slaughtering, the selling all in-house. We control the meat production, not the pig with the sell. Um, that's really important for us. Uh, if we were sending these out to custom processors, we would not make that much money on. They take care of so much of our waste stream. Um, anytime we clean up a bed and it's not mowed back in, like winter, winter squash vines, um, summer squash, mammoth vines, whatever, goes to the pigs, uh, restaurant scraps, our neighbors, local schools, the food bank, they give us pallets of food that's gone too far moldy for them to give out to humans. They'll throw it in a deep freezer on them, pick it up in a truck, and unload a pallet into, how am I doing on time? Uh, wrap it up pretty soon. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you tell me. All right. Uh, so let me get through some photos here of the pigs. I mean, look at this food waste, it's insane. Yeah, they're happy, happy pigs. They're probably my favorite because there's so much less labor involved with pigs than almost anything else we do. I also really like this uh, hot tape. You can step out on any side. If anyone has a problem, volunteers in their feeding, you can step out on any side of that thing. All right, uh, wrapping up here, they are my personal favorite because of the low labor. You know. Butcher and slaughter, that takes up two to three full days, sure. But compared to chickens, you don't have to be in there nearly as often as humans. Get through the chickens real quick here. Got a nice little coop on the property. They pasture on about a half an acre back there. Of course, it was cold, none of them were out. Um, and then finish up here, we, like I mentioned, we're direct marketing. So um, we do all of our own CSA signups. Uh, we work with SNAP, UBT, and Double Up Food, food Bucks programs to accept SNAP benefits. Um, we do an on-site farm stand, and um, it's really key for us on this scale to, to command more of that dollar through that direct sale. That's, that's huge for us. We do open houses for a lot of farm. I know I've seen some of you guys that are open houses. That's our buddy Rooster, Cloverleaf Banjo Shop. He comes out and plays that every time. And this is us at market. Just finish up with some pictures here. So your, your basic market cornucopia. You know, we try to focus on our display to make it welcoming, um, and that way we can get that higher dollar per unit if folks want to come in and, and shop with us. This is our roadside stand. You can see the low tunnels on the property there. That's our CSA sign up flyer. All this can be found on our website as well. That's a, a picture of a CSA box from um, early, early fall. And finally, what I'm involved in outside of uh, the farm is I'm the president of the Larry County Farmers Alliance, we're with Rocky Mountain Farmers Union and National Farmers Coalition. And our campaigns right now are on land access, how to get producers onto city owned, county owned conservation land. Uh, we had some input in the city plan draft process for Collins recently. And then um, our, our project at hand is the farm stand built, HB19-1191. This will legalize sale of produce from your property or anything that you produce on your property, not just veggies, um, regardless of how you're selling, regardless of acreage, um, residential, commercial, ag. Right now, our farm stand is illegal. We've been operating it, um, but we have a cease and desist from the city. So I would encourage you guys to get activated on this bill. Um, yeah, not many people know that. But now this bill is in place, so I'm going to air it out. Uh, this is the bill. Our rep, Jenny Arndt, is on it. If it fails, I'm going to apply for variance in the city of Fort Collins. But if this passes, everybody's got open season on selling stuff in their properties, which a lot of people don't know has been illegal, especially if you're selling residential. We're selling that. You're selling three acres. It's an archaic law well, if you're under three acres, no matter if you're selling farm, you cannot sell. Okay. That's about it. <laughs>